Welcome everybody to Rudder's series of webinars around the e-commerce like landscape and uh, some of the upcoming trends where we feature folks from the e-commerce world. I'm David. I lead growth and marketing like you here at Rudder and we're, we're a universal API for like commerce, accounting, payments, uh, and subscription platforms. And today we're, we're excited to welcome our guest, Adi, who is who is the co-founder of Cogsy and also previously co-founded WooCommerce. And so thanks for being here, Adi. No, David, thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, why don't we just kick things off? We'd love to get a quick introduction and your backstory and like how you even ended up in the world of e-commerce. And I believe it's over a decade now that, that you've been in the e-commerce space. Yes. And so I'm sure a lot has changed as well, but would, would love to hear the, the quick story. Yeah, so um, I think my... Uh... My journey into e-commerce was, a, I, I think, a serendipitous and a coincidental one, David. So uh, way back in 2007, I was finishing my accounting degree at, uh, at Varsity, and I effectively built the first product that then became WooThemes initially, um, and WooThemes became WooCommerce. But WooThemes before that was merely kind of your templated designs uh, built on top of WordPress. That's where I had my start. And <clears throat> the way we kind of you went from you know, building templates for WordPress uh, into WooCommerce was very simply observing what customers were doing. They kept demanding uh, that kind of in businesses at that stage. I mean, the, our biggest selling category were themes for businesses. So think typical kind of brochure website, 2008, 2009. And they kept coming back to us saying, hey, guys, I need to add a shopping cart. How do I do this? And that stage, like the WordPress ecosystem itself, like didn't have a great plugin. So we eventually got into building WooCommerce, um, which changed the business around kind of overnight. Like I, I think if I remember stats correctly, like within within a year, WooCommerce became ninety uh, percent of the business. And at that stage, we were already doing um, single digit millions in, in in revenue. So that's how significant that kind of change was. To pretend at this stage that kind of, if that was a start of the kind of e-commerce journey for me, <clears throat> to pretend that that was planned, like that's a complete lie. Okay. As I said, like we, we, we just got into that. Um, but subsequently kind of the short version for the rest of my uh, kind of you know, journey there is I stepped uh, down as CEO of, of Woo in 2013. Um, Woo sold to Automatic, the holding company for, for WordPress, uh, amongst other things. I started a new company initially called Receiptful, eventually called Convergio, which was email marketing automation for e-commerce brands, predominantly built into the Shopify ecosystem, sold that in 2019 uh, to Campaign Monitor, the Campaign Monitor group, uh, spent a year there, uh, had the idea or came back to an idea that I had years ago um, around kind of you're building a better inventory management system. Um, and that is, I think, somewhat what, um, you know, Cogsy is today, where we play into kind of your, where we have designed the product to be an intelligence and optimization layer for kind of your retail brands inventory. I love how you're just like tackling every single part of the stack. And <laughs> I'd be excited to see like a decade from now, like what you've done next. But I, I guess on, on that note, I'm curious, like what, what has prompted you to start more companies uh, in the space? And how have you thought about like each of those subsequent like chapters and where you are with Cogsy today? Yeah, I guess like kind of the, the there are parts of it, David, that's where I would say uh, there's persistent things and there's things that kind of have changed for me. I think if I think about persistent things um, and why I've been this kind of one trick pony in terms of building software for e-commerce or retail brands, I like I, my mind goes to things like, well, I understand the merchants. Um, I have connections. I have friends. I have founder friends in the space that sell to the same merchants, right? So that kind of networking. So those of those things, Across every company, you kind of build up, uh, build that up. You accumulate that, and that's beneficial in every kind of new new chapter. Other things like that's not maybe industry industry specific. It's there are things around like my desire to build teams. Like I really love building teams, for example. Like so all of those things are, I would say, kind of more persistent things going from one company to the next. But the, for me, at least, like there, I I I'm not really the kind of person at this stage. I mean, and I'm still. I, I somewhere sometimes say I'm pretty old. Um, I'm only 38 years old, so I'm not that old. Like I can still probably start a few companies if I wanted to, but I don't imagine myself at this stage of life sticking to something for you know 20, 50, you know, 15, 20 years. I like that newness and I like that intellectual kind of stimulation. So if I take you know pre cogsy take Convergio as a kind of email marketing automation tool. Like I'm not an email marketer, like not classically trained, never practices that as that, but it's an intellectual challenge at that stage. And the same with Cogsy now, I'm not 
an operator. I've never been an operator at a direct to consumer brand. I'm not a demand planner, but there is a, a, a lot of, I, I take a lot of joy from that intellectual curiosity about, yes, I know the space and I know how to be able to speak to merchants and understand a broader set of the, kind of the challenges that they need to solve within their business, but I can really dig into those very specific things sequentially. And I like to change that every couple of years. I love it. And it's it's a great time to be in e-commerce as you were just like talking about uh, with, with the recent like record sales. And I'm sure like a lot of our audience would, would be curious to, to get your thoughts and coming from like 10 years ago and how the ecosystem has changed and then your reaction to where e-commerce sits today and like what's to come. Yeah, so I think that kind of... Um... As a kind of retrospective, at least, David, I think the, the thing that's most surprised me um, in terms of e-commerce is just the continuous kind of trend of how much how much of, kind of consumer disposable kind of income is being spent in some kind of digital manner. Online, I don't think the kind of the the notion of saying like I spend my money online these days is that's a little kind of moot, right? We all have different devices. There's different ways of transacting in some kind of digital kind of um, you know, medium, at least. Um, so looking back, I think like if you asked me like 10 years ago, what do I think would happen? Like I would tell you it will grow. It's far exceeded kind of those expectations. Um, and I think like if I think about kind of where we're at and kind of the, you know, and I had to predict the future gun to my head, like I would think in the similar way. I think there's so much um, of transacting for goods or services that's still not digital, right? Um, and I can only imagine as, and again, like I'm not a super sci-fi buff, you know, buff in terms of kind of how how we merge with the cyborgs and how <clears throat> the cyborgs become us, et cetera. But I can only imagine that kind of the future like is gonna be more electronic, more digital. And like, that's what I expect from, from commerce. And I think in the very recent past is yes, with all these macroeconomic uncertainties and newness, that kind of has happened and market generally being down, the thing that's still kind of pretty consistent is people are buying stuff. Um, and I think that's where my cautious optimism lies. Like people are going to continue, going to, continue to buy stuff like in you know, next year, five years time, 10 years time, 50 years time. Like, I, I don't imagine that ever changing. Um, my change in kind of its nature, but fundamentally that doesn't change in my mind. For sure. And that's a great signal for all these merchants that we, we love supporting and switching gears a little bit then as this proliferation has happened, the, the e-commerce tech stack has also gotten a lot more complicated. And I'm curious, like, how do you think about this evolution of the e-commerce tech stack from when you first started with, with the WooCommerce, like plug in uh, with Woo themes to and today where there's like thousands of like options for for these merchants and how should like merch like think about approaching things and like even building uh, their, their own tech stack yeah so I think that kind of the, the most interesting things that I see at least from a kind of tech stack standpoint kind of two phenomena um, the one being is I do think that kind of your merchants brands um they're picking best in class tools for every single part of their tech stack, even if that comes at the cost of kind of your data connectivity um, or the kind of your data fragmentation, at least, right? So that's the one thing that I'm definitely seeing there. And it, that kind of makes sense, right? Like if any single, you know, single part of your business is that important for you to go pursue a best in class tool, then you will take on some cost to do that, right? Like a simple example is, you know, if if email marketing is the way that you grow and that's like what you know, and like that's the thing that delivers the most value, then you will change your tech stack to the tool that you think will do that best, even if it comes at a sacrifice in the rest of your tech stack, right? So that's basically what the kind of, the you know part of my observation there. The other part of my observation is as, as much as we kind of you talk about and often there's these kind of listicles or these influencers pretending to have kind of this per perfect blueprint for how an e-commerce brand or kind of you know, a retail brand. And by the way, when I refer to retail brand, I just mean like people sell anywhere and everywhere all the time, right? Like I, I for me, there's no distinction anymore. Like so, I I like the idea of uh, thinking through kind of just retail brand. But what they're ultimately doing is even though some believe that there are some best practices. Here's like five steps and just do this. Brands are kind of, you know, they're just remixing their operations, right? And if they're remixing their operations on like on the actual ground level where like, especially when you're doing physical commerce where that needs to happen, then they, they, they can require their tech stack to conform to that. So 
I think that they're like, if, again, if you take, take e-commerce platform out of it, let's just assume that every single merchant's on Shopify. I think there are probably one or two categories that I would consider one, right? Like, you know, email marketing, you'll probably find that more than 50% of Shopify merchants use Klaviyo, right? So whatever the actual number is, right? They've probably won that category. But for the rest of that tech stack, like it is a total remix, right? Which is representative of those operations. So like crucially, I think um, what happens then is, and like this is part of where Kogi plays into as well is, but as soon as that kind of tech stack kind of decentralizes in more of a manner, you can't just rely on your e-commerce platform in the same way that you could in the past to be your kind of single source of truth. And I think that's like one of the bigger challenges that most brands have is they have these pockets of information or data or insight reporting, whatever you want to call that, but no single source of truth um, anymore because it like the tools have just kind of you know, decentralized that kind of that knowledge and that insight to such a great de degree. Um, and there's nothing been built to connect those things again. For sure. I'm curious, digging into your, your latest venture, CogC, what was the inspiration behind deciding to tackle this problem around inventory management and all the hairy problems that these like operators, e-commerce operators face? And yeah, would would just lo love to learn more about the backstory there. Yeah. So um, it's pretty, um, well, it's a, a coming together of a few different things in my past, David. So like the one note I mentioned earlier uh, before WooCommerce, uh, I studied accounting. Accounting is like something my dad drilled into in, into me. Um, I still do bookkeeping for for Cogsy, for example. I I understand numbers. I can do those things. Don't ask me for tax advice. Um, I'm not willing to be be liable for for bad tax advice at least. But everything else I, I understand. So that was the one node. Um, and then the other node beyond kind of my focus on kind of an experience within e-commerce was really around the last couple of years where I was essentially the tech and financial co-pilot for my wife and her local kind of retail business. And I, I saw how, to what extent, um, it was a challenge for a smaller team to truly wield kind of the power um, and the value from these kind of operational tools or inventory focused tools that she was using. And the original idea for Cogsy was to be um, what I would think is what I would term as classical inventory management. So think your typical kind of, um, I wouldn't even say now since seven, but think back then, um, you know, Trade Gecko, um, Stitch Labs, like those kinds of tools. I here's a tool, does kind of your stock control, does your kind of purchasing, does the calculation of cogs, right? Like that was one of the crucial outputs. And that's where the name Cogsy comes from. Like it is like it initially alludes to uh you know cost of goods sold. Uh and that was the initial kind of project scope as well. Like that's what the V1 was going to be. The only reason why we didn't start there and, and why we kind of you shifted before building that was I think that kind of the that historic inventory management system is a very wide product to build. And like ultimately I, I've never met a single user that loves their IMS. Um, so we instead kind of you know, shifted from there and said, listen, you're like, we know that there's a challenge here. And this was before. Um, kind of supply chain was like a massive, you know, kind of challenge. Like, I think we were just experiencing with the pandemic uh, at the time that I came back to this idea, um, how disrupted the supply chain would be. But what was evident in those kind of your know, first um, conversations I had with merchants was kind of in that greater realm of their operations, their has been a lack of investment from software providers. Like everyone invested in kind of your, your new marketing, kind of your market worthy stuff, like i.e. email marketing, SMS marketing. We feel like really kind of you know, uh, improve those things to the nth degree, but the back office didn't get love. And I just figured that that presents some blue ocean um, in which to, to have fun uh, and, and try and build a, a different kind of solution that ultimately gets operations out of spreadsheets. For sure. I'm sure all these e-commerce operators will, will love moving like their spreadsheets and like their, their many spreadsheets to, to Cogsy. And I'm curious, what was that initial process of like convincing merchants to try out the Cogsy solution and like uh, finding those early believers? I'm curious what, what did those conversations look like? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think going from zero to one is, is, is always hard, right? Like I think if you ask any founder, that's, you know, one of the hardest kind of phases. I think two, two things, you know, helped us initially uh, in that sense, David. I think for me, like having a reputation, being able to rely on some previous uh, relationships to at least have a 
kind of a, a warm entry into a conversation, right? Which like is is helpful because the first conversations I had was like way before we had any product that I could show them, um, before wireframes, et cetera, right? It was really just a conceptual idea. And then <clears throat> secondly, we we have a few, and I think, um, you know, thinking back now, you know, Caraway um, is probably one of the kind of best examples, but they were a very early customer of ours. And, and Mark Riskovitz, who's, the, who's now the VP of operations there, he is just that kind of um, very forward thinking kind of early adopter. And he knew what kind of your Caraway would, almost like he has this great ability where from a technological standpoint, he just knew at every single step what Caraway would need for the next two or three years almost. And he's managed to kind of you know, future proof some of their tech decisions in, in that regard. So we managed to kind of you know, land um, your mark as a customer very early on and like amongst a few other brands. And I think being able to, for me, again, like I mentioned earlier, like I'm not an operator or demand planner um, by kind of trade or training. So being able to re rely on these really great, ambitious, growing brands and those individuals <clears throat> and just learning from them, like that's been integral to, to how we've shaped the roadmap um, and how we got to where we're, we're at today. For sure. And thanks so much of what we've seen at Redder is this, this idea of like, how do you make sure that all your like systems can like talk to each other and that you're able to support different like integrations, uh, whether it's across vendors or across platforms as well. I'm curious, given Cogsy plays this role of being the source of truth for like inventory or like operations, like data, I'm curious how you've thought about this idea of interoperability and how, how systems should like talk to each other and how you're able to like maintain the accuracy across all these systems. Yeah. So <clears throat> So I think what I can share immediately there is that part of our mission, at least, is um, I think twofold. A is to be ubiquitous across the whole tech stack. I think, you know, for us at least, is um, like I, I mean, ask me separately with a beer whether I have an opinion about shop versus WooCommerce, and then yes, I like I will have opinions. But if you come to me and you say like I need help, like can Cogsy help me? Like I don't discriminate between where your data lives. So like the key for us over time is in being ubiquitous is ultimately building out integrations to wherever your SKU level kind of data exists, right? Because we're trying to add some intelligence, some optimization on, on top of that. So that's the first part thereof. Uh, the second part is actually, I can credit my dad for, for this. So in terms of accounting, for anyone listening is familiar, uh, if you're familiar with the trial balance, it's a simple calculation slash statement um, in the preparation of financial statements that makes sure that your debits and credits balance, right? And if it doesn't balance, you know that something's kind of gone wrong somewhere. And my dad used to say, he drilled this one kind of concept into my into my <laughs> very kind of small brain at the time, uh, which was if kind of either one of those sides is out by $1, you can't dismiss it as being immaterial and say, well, it's just $1, I can continue because you could be out a million dollars on kind of on, on the credit side and 999999 on debit side. So you have to investigate. So that kind of, um, like I, I, I would now use the word kind of anal with my dad in, in terms of how my dad is with kind of data and information. Like, and, and he probably was, and as a kid, that's what it felt like. But that kind of obsession in terms of data integrity is something that we've tried to bake into how we think about Cogsy. So a lot of what we do, we, for example, don't have all the integrations just yet. Like we've had to do them sequentially, but we are being very deliberate and intentional around when we're kind of mapping different data sources that have the same kind of object level data together. So again, like if you think SKU as a kind of unique identifier, like if we are grabbing historic sales from a certain kind of uh, underlying data source and we're grabbing inventory levels from another and we're grabbing purchase orders from in incoming units that's from another source like we want to make sure that if we map those things together like we're actually putting you in a better position than kind of what you would have been if you just did that manually into a spreadsheet right so as i said like firstly getting that coverage and being ubiquitous but the second part is like really obsessing about the data integrity. And I think ultimately, like I would, I often sell kind of your brands as like, it doesn't help. Like we can probably not help you be do better planning or optimize your kind of inventory management. 
if we can't get close to 100% uh, data coverage, right? So like if there's a sales channel or you have a stock location and that's a material part of your business, i.e. I would say material is anything more than kind of two, three, four, five percent then like I would probably rather not work with you purely out of principle, right? Like, cause I can't, I can't fully uh, quantify that materiality. And that's the extent I would rather lose a new customer account or existing customer account based on that kind of principle than gain a customer account because we pretend to be able to deliver value, even though we don't have hundred percent access to, to your data and information that we need. For sure. So it sounds like when I think about Cogs Theater, a few parts, it's like getting that like source of truth and like that data and being that having really high data integrity. And there's that second part around like that, like intelligence layer and like, how do I provide like insights for you? And I'm curious digging into that second part as well. It's like, how do you think about the current state of how people do things today? And then what you're hoping to achieve as a future state with Cogs uh, through this like intelligence layer? Yeah. Many opinions. Um, <laughs> I think like there's probably two prominent things that I can share there, David. I think you firstly, um, I'm, I understand why spreadsheets are so prevalent in so many businesses. Like if for any kind of anyone that's in any way technologically kind of orientated here, if you think through kind of user interfaces, a spreadsheet is pretty much kind of the most flexible user interface that you can ever have, right? Because um, you can essentially design any kind of model in any kind of format that you want. Um, and you've got a great bunch of fun functions to do that, right? Like if you're just using Google Sheets now, I mean, there's so many connected features, like you can do a lot in a spreadsheet. The downside of all those things is it needs to be mostly manually updated, right? So you struggle you to get into human error. And you, even though the output could be great, there's often things that kind of your patterns or opportunities that you and I simply can't recognize. And I think like that's that's my flip into kind of why any kind of um you know optimization or intelligence tool like a cogsy starts making sense as a replacement for a spreadsheet not because it is the most flexible user interface like i i need i need 50 times more venture capital than i've raised to be able to kind of be a bold uh, kind of a e-commerce specific user interface that can mimic the flexibility that the spreadsheet has. So that's not the thing. The, the kind of the, the the key takeaway there is that like you take the kind of the the weaknesses that a human brings in an environment and you start improving on them. And I think the kind of the the things that improves there, and this is my second cut you covered here, is I am not that bullish on any kind of your programmatic forecast that can predict the future. I like that's not the way we sell Cogsy. Yes, we've got a machine learning based algorithm that will help generate a baseline forecast in terms of what we believe is next, right? That's not a kind of a, a, a perfect prediction of the future. I mean, like that's not what we sell. What I instead think in terms of kind of how that intelligence is combined with the visibility is like our ultimate goal is to kind of allow a team or an operator, CEO, whoever is responsible for greater operations and inventory management at a brand to be able to be really proactive in terms of how they make decisions, whether it's about avoiding a loss, i.e. a stock out, whether it's about seizing an opportunity where you see a sales trend um, and you can double down by getting a great kind of additional purchase order and additional stock in, like that is more where I see a machine kind of being beneficial because a machine is really good um, at spotting trends earlier than the human eye can. Like even the trained human eye looking at the same data set over and over again is more likely to miss a potential kind of trend and opportunity or risk than what a machine is. So that's really how we, like at this stage, again, like I, um, I, I, even though I'm a technologist, I tend to always pull myself slightly back in terms of what I think kind of, you know, artificial intelligence um, you know, can do here. And I'm still very much in that camp of like, yes, we can kind of, I think we can evolve in this regard away from spreadsheets into something that is more automated, more machine driven, more intelligent, more accurate in nature, more you know, proactive. But I still very much fall in the camp that, you know, Cogsy is very much software that should be used by a human. And there's still a kind of collaboration between those two kind of entities. For sure. I feel like my appropriate next question should be when is Cogsy going to start adding some of the large language models and all the <laughs> all the jazz around uh, GPT three and <laughs> well, if um, I, I suspect David, if um, 
Yeah. If we need a new venture capital, um, then we probably missed the boat. I think um, I'm not so, again, I'm not so sure yeah. that I think kind of your gener generative kind of your AI is, um, is, is worth all the hype. I think that kind of the advancements are absolutely fantastic, right? And there's some of the things that's kind of happening is some, you know, something fantastic, but I also there, I mostly feel that if you're taking kind of, uh, you know, GPT-3, I think it's a great starting point for whatever content you're about to write. And then a human should still finish the process, right? Um, so I think if like if we're aligned on that, then I think, yes, it's amazing. Um, luckily though, like there's, I, I can only have one black box within my business, right? And <laughs> like the, the kind of algorithmic forecasting where we do is already a bit of a black box. So um, no more black boxes within Cogsy anytime soon. For sure. And uh, I have to go back to your earlier comment around getting your thoughts on WooCommerce versus Shopify versus big commerce and all these different platforms. And I'm sure like you've seen just the evolution as well from like when, when you first started and now you have, uh, I guess, like Squarespace and Webflow getting into building their own e-commerce product. And then you have like those, all the headless commerce uh, companies as well, like Fabric, Shogun. And so I'm curious to just get, get your thoughts and one, like how it's evolved and, and then two, like wh where you see the landscape going. And then when I get, get a chance to, to get you a beer, we can talk about this <laughs> commerce or just Shopify. <laughs> no, so, um, and I, by the way, like there is no, um, yeah, there is no, 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 no true WooCommerce yeah. Shopify conversation. My, my wife's business, uh, she acquired the business that, that she ran for six years and they originally used, a, if I remember correctly, a custom .NET built um, e-commerce platform. Um, so I switched her away from that and I actually switched her to Shopify, by the way, um, instead of WooCommerce. So yeah. I, I very much, you know, they, they, I think I lean towards like a horses for courses approach, right? I think there are many great kind of platforms um, and they all have strengths and weaknesses. And like, you should pick whatever makes your business most successful. I think you can pretty much pick any of the big platforms. And if your kind of view is on the big platforms that they're going to be around for another five, 10 years, then like you future-proofed your decision kind of you mostly, right? So um, I don't think you can go wrong with either Shopify or or WooCommerce today. I think what's more interesting there is what perhaps isn't always as obvious for users of the platform because they don't necessarily compare themselves, but I can see distinct um, different characteristics in the kind of the average persona that uses the, the, these different platforms, right? So like for, for WooCommerce, like the, because it's based within WordPress and the eco, you know, uh, open source ecosystem, like you always find that like there's, there's, the way the that kind of persona purchases software is always like, hey, I actually want to have access to the code ideally, or like I, I'm going to want to you know customize things more than perhaps a Shopify user that is more adept to installing um, installing something onto the Shopify store and toggling a few kind of customizations um, and then having an output that's kind of limited. So I think that's more of the interesting observation. Observation. I five years down the line. Shopify is still a thriving company, WooCommerce is still a thriving company, and there's still enough market share for kind of, you know, all of the kind of the, the I would say the longer tail kind of players to also have kind of, you know, space um, in, in the market. For sure. And obviously like, yeah, WooCommerce has gotten a lot of like prominence. It's like continued growth since, since you guys sold, sold the business. And I'm curious, just reflecting back, what would you say were, were the things that you guys like got right? At, at WooCommerce in those early days and what, what allowed it to really like take off and like uh, even today like be be such like a big player in the ecosystem oh I think um the very early days uh, David I I would kind of attribute it to two things which is um a I think our branding was always great so like we, I th we had great um we had fun branding in the day if everyone yeah. remembers and saw it like we actually had our mascot was a little ninja um the Woo ninja I still I think I still have a plushy that we custom made um, from an Etsy seller back in the day, for example. So I think the branding was always fun. Like we, we were a serious business, but we were always lighthearted enough that I think, and that resonated with our customers at least. Um, like I, I attended a few kind of WordPress centric kind of meetups in the past, and I, I think the feedback that we always got was like, you guys are just as fun in person as you seem to be kind of online and vice versa. So like I think 
part of that branding really worked. Um, and then the other part of it, at least in the early days, was like we obsessed about, you know, customer support and customer service. Um, mm-hmm. So like Magnus, Mark and I, like we were often, especially in the early days, and when we had built out a success and support team, um, we would be in the help desk every single day supporting you know, customers. And I think like if you ask me, like, why is WooCommerce still so significant today is probably because of the latter. Like I, I, I know, at, especially at some stage, and I don't know what the current stats are. Like response times for WooCommerce users getting support, like it slowed down significantly, especially if it was more technical, the issue was more technical of nature. But we always try to go the extra mile for for customers. And when, I mean, I mentioned that kind of open source ethos around uh, the flexibility, the customizability, that played like those two things without really knowing it at the time, probably. Um, or connecting those two dots. But when you then go the extra mile, you're essentially kind of helping someone be more flexible, be more customizable in what they're you know trying to kind of to, to get out. And like that's probably one of the key reasons why one would pick a WooCommerce over a Shopify today, right? I think the thing that I um like I often hear um around flexibility, right, is payment processing. Um, you know, Shopify has built a very, very large and substantial business off of kind of your payment processing and shop pay and shop pay is a great kind of solution but you as a merchant you don't control the payment token like that's actually entirely possible when you have a woocommerce store like you can shop around and you can like depending on your geography like you can probably find a payment processor i.e a stripe where you can own your own payment token um, which gives you more flexibility in terms of how you cross sell, upsell, switch to subscriptions, switch back to once off purchases, et cetera, right? There, there is some flexibility there and Shopify has made, made great strides there. But I think like if you can build, if, in the WooCommerce kind of ecosystem, if you want to thrive, like you need to consider that that's the DNA of the kind of the ultimate user, um, not just the brand or the business, the ultimate user using the thing, like this thing in your software, they're actually expecting that um, kind of flexibility and customizability. Uh, and as I said, I think that's been a huge part of why WooCommerce is successful because we essentially and effectively aligned ourselves with that DNA that was already in the WordPress e- you know, kind of you know, ecosystem that we just matter to you know, happen to fall into. For sure. Yeah. No, I think the, the distinction around, yeah, the, the like open source, like customizability and like flexibility, I think definitely like resonates in today. I feel like, like is strongly associated with like the WooCommerce brand. I, I, I'm curious, like uh, beyond these kind of like platforms, like what are areas in e-commerce uh, that you're like spending your most time in when it comes to like, just like trends you're monitoring, like uh, areas that you're excited about. Uh, you mentioned like doing a little bit of like investing as well. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like uh, yeah, what what are things that, that you're keeping tabs on? Um, so firstly, the thing that, I mean, you mentioned earlier, the thing that probably least excites me, even though it's attracted a lot of attention, is um, generally just headless front ends. I, yeah. um, I, I understand where the impetus of this comes from, um, but I'm also re- very recently hearing of brands that switched to headless and now are switching back. Because I've never, you know, fully understood how um kind of how this makes sense for for most brands where the kind of you the cost to roi kind of trade-off happens so um there's quite a few companies and i don't mean to step on toes like this is also just kind of one opinion but that's probably kind of the the parts of the space that's been um talked about a lot in the last can i say 12 18 24 months um that i'm least interested in we're at today like and especially if i put my investor hat on um I think I, well, even before my investor app, like I, I'm building a company in that kind of your greater operational space. And I think like there's still a lot of blue ocean there, whether it's um, accounting, whether it's more of the fulfillment side. I think if you think through kind of um, challenges like cross-border fulfillment, I think that there is a lot of tooling that can still happen there. Um, putting all these things together, um, like there's kind of, I think some some interesting thing there. Um, so that's definitely kind of space that I'm, you're still bullish on, as I said, hence why I'm building into that space my, myself. The other part um, I would say that kind of interests me, and I touched on this earlier, is as this kind of tech stack kind of you know, fragments, like I am interested in those solutions that become a bit of a kind of bridge or a connector, or ultimately you know a new source of truth, right? Like that interests me um, as well. And then I would, um, I mean, as an investor, I would probably have a separate thesis, but probably around kind of where, you know, a, a founder or a team 
can build a solution that's firstly aimed at kind of your brands that sell physical goods online, but then actually takes that solution um, and sell into kind of you know other verticals as well, right? So like you think, I think the kind of the you know e-commerce enablement tech for physical goods is super um, evolved at this stage. Like very, there's very you know, small pieces of the pie that's kind of completely uncovered. Like yes, you might not have great solutions or category winners and all of them, but the greater kind of spectrum is, is is well covered. I still think there's other verticals if you think through kind of hospitality, for example. Like they probably still lack some you know key functionality. I don't know whether you can create a Clavio specifically for the hospitality industry, right? Um, and maybe it's not that, but I do like the idea of kind of building new tools that are um, users of e-commerce just to get started, but then splits off into those other verticals. Super interested and curious to see what happens next. For sure. Yeah, I think that trend around like vertical SaaS is definitely like an interesting one. I, I remember like talking to someone at like Squire, the, the the software for barbershops and like how like a lot of these barbershops themselves are even using like Shopify to like sell like products uh, online. And so, yeah, the, the, the kind of like combination of a lot of these like offline like businesses are starting to go online as well and like participating in this like e-commerce like economy, which which is definitely like uh, really exciting. And we, we see like a lot of these like tooling uh, get built like uh, at Rudder and like companies that we're supporting as well, but uh, definitely got a very, very interesting wave in trend. Totally. And I think that it, what is interesting there, there with that, because I, and I, um, this is probably the only um, time that I'll play that card of saying, like, "Hey, I am the experienced founder, right?" But yeah. if you've not if you've not built a platform yourself, I don't think people truly understand um, what goes into building a platform. So, especially within this Shopify ecosystem, there's kind of a many kind of vocal groups on whatever social media platform you want to look at, and there's often criticism leveled at Shopify to say, like, why didn't you guys just build this? Like, you're in the perfect position to build this, right? Like, why do we need external solution to do that? Whereas, like, we sh think this should be a, a kind of platform thing. But you just pointed at, like, in my opinion, like, one of the reasons why a platform can't perfectly solve everything, right? Ultimately, like, again, like, whether you can build it, like, I don't think you can build a, a Shopify-sized company purely for barber shops, right? But... Two ver like there's two truths probably like in in that scenario is one is like you mentioned it like you can run a barbershop of, of Shopify right that that is possible to do that but a specialized platform for barbershops that mimics what you can do in that kind of you know that setup plus adds those kind of specific things that you also need is probably better for the barbershop right so but from a platform perspective like Shopify like they it's impossible for them to do it for every single kind of your vertical or every single kind of your niche right like it's it's simply not possible and i think that's why like all of these platforms have to take a step back and say like this is what we're going to carve out and for the rest of it we're actually going to allow the kind of the developer and the business ecosystem to kind of you know develop around us to solve for those kind of your smaller parts of the kind of the, the functional spectrum that we can't solve as well for. For sure. Yeah, I think it makes a ton of sense. And switching from the e-com enablement side, just like what you've seen from like merchants and even some of these retail stores trying to go online. I'm curious, like, what are your thoughts on like some of the trends, whether we, we have like this whole like direct to consumer wave that, that came like in the last like few years. And that thing, the last two years, we had like all these like aggregator companies like buying up like multiple brands and like uh and like like, like almost like PE style roll-ups and so I, I'm just curious like get your thoughts and like yeah just some of like what, what you've seen from from the merchant brand side and like uh and, and what you think will what will play out in like the next few years as well yeah so I think the my first observation there David is that we've been speaking about kind of this notion of omni-channel forever, which in my words, like omni-channel always meant that can I sell to the customer um, kind of where they're already at, right? So whether that is on my website, whether that's in a social media channel, i.e. their Facebook messenger, kind of your, kind of your thread, whatever the case is, I want to be omni-channel and I want to be relatively consistent in terms of how I present myself, my products, um, my brand, you know, in those Kind of your different mediums or context so that i have similar conversion rates and the customer can bounce from one experience or one context to the next and like it's a relatively smooth process 
I finally think that we are back there now. So like what's definitely been interesting with, you know, in the, kind of the, the realm of kind of Cogsy and why Cogsy has focused, like we've recently made some changes on the product side to kind of primarily focus on brands um, that sell multi-channel and have mm. multiple inventory locations is what we've seen is so many brands are trying to sell in more than one channel much, much sooner than they did in the past. So I think in the last couple of years, it was feasible for you to only have a direct to consumer channel and really nail one way of acquiring customers, whether that was Facebook ads or another way, right? And you can build a really significant business in that way. But with all the kind of the attribution and privacy kind of challenges that have happened, like that's not viable anymore. So I, I'm at least saying like the best brands are thinking like, how do we show up in these other channels? Like whether it's adding a wholesale or some kind of B2B kind of retail channel, whether it's you know also selling on marketplaces. Um, like I think the fascinating thing for some brands is initially, I think, you know, kind of the, the there's a, at least for direct consumer brands, there's some reluctance to sell on Amazon. Like many of those brands, like we now see, they sell on Amazon. They're trying to figure out like, how do these things like complement each other, i.e. direct channel and you know, shop uh, and the Amazon channel, right? So that's happening. And they're going into physical retail, whether it's through their own stores, like focusing on more of the kind of experience and having this almost like landmark significant um, kind of experience for, for shoppers that want to go there. And they say like, that's perfectly fine. We'll have two or three of these flagship stores or going into kind of your, your large kind of nationwide um, your retailer. So I definitely see that as a kind of, emerging and accelerating trend like i i totally imagine like brands will want to show up um in the best possible way in more of these channels going forward for sure and uh yeah the, the, the b2b component is also just like very interesting to your point like even that wholesale aspect where uh, a lot of it is still only starting to go online and um, like we, we were talking to like somebody in the b2b commerce like space uh, at salsify a couple of weeks back and they had mentioned like that kind of like emerging trend and so yeah definitely like i feel like a lot of excitement around like omni channel and i think like makes makes like a solution like coxy like even more like important for for all these different brands that that's that, that's definitely a hope right i mean i might be completely wrong i, I might be doing the exact opposite to what I proposed that operators do themselves in terms of like how humans are sometimes not great at spotting trends. Um, I hope we're right in kind of the trend that we've kind of spotted here. And like, that is partly what, you know, Cogsy is trying to solve for both in terms of like being that operational sort of truth, building that visibility, but then ultimately safely kind of, or I say safely, but optimally helping kind of your brand sell on all those channels at the same time. For sure. Uh, now switching gears a little bit, like you, you've started like three companies uh, and two of them you've sold. Now you're working third one Cogsy. I'm curious, like what are some of the lessons that you're taking from building like WooCommerce and Converge to like how you're approaching like building Cogsy? Yeah, I think uh, probably the, the most prominent things that are around um, how I now think about humans and, and culture. So uh, like one of the kind of later learnings in, in the WooCommerce journey, a uh, good friend of mine, Jason Cohen over at um, now WP Engine, probably the biggest, I think they're the biggest um, you know, WordPress centric you know, hosting company. Um, but he said something which was, and I don't know whether he originally said it, but I, like I heard it from him, which was um, your know, culture like, like happens to you whether you do something or you know about it or not, right? And this was a like kind of idea that if as a team, if you're not intentional about culture, you can say you don't have a culture, but the reality is that there is culture. It's just not intentional and everyone is not explicit um, about what that means, which generally means that they're kind of worst case, it's just like kind of minor misalignment kind of your, um, or kind of best case is minor um, misalignment. Worst case is there's a lot of unhappy, unproductive people on your team. Um, so. I kind of took that and I went into, you know, uh, Convergio and like, I, I tried to be really intentional around kind of culture. How do you build that out? Like, what does it actually mean? Like, what does it mean to kind of have values? And where my team and I ultimately landed was this idea of building a, a life and family first company. And the kind of succinct version is just that we, we told ourselves, if I remember the words correctly, we said, um, we want to do challenging, um, profitable um, and fun work, but the most meaningful experiences that we can have is probably 
outside of work with people that are not our colleagues. Like, so I, I, I definitely dislike this idea of saying that your co colleagues are like family. Cause I'm like, no, 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 I have, I've got a real family at home. I've got a wife and kids and, uh, you know, extended kind of your know, blood related family, um, you know, beyond that. So really had this kind of, you know, uh, evolution at least in terms of how I think about building teams and running teams and how, what that means for how we work and um, I mean I told you offline just before, before we went online uh, my first hire at Convergio engineer Stefano like today he's my CTO and co-founder at Cogi so he and I have worked together for at this stage eight eight and a half years and Cogsy has really been like how do we take all of that learning in terms of what worked, what didn't work at you know, Cogsy in terms of how we think about culture? And we just continue to evolve that because I think ultimately what I would love to do is I would love to get to, and I put those of different kind of you know, uh, actionable kind of your know, tactics and you know different angles in terms of how to look at this. But I think the ultimate outcome um, that I want to get to is I want to build the kind of the most diverse team I can and then ask all of those amazing human beings to show up on the team and in their work as their unique whole selves. Because I think like once you do that and you empower, like empower is one of the kind of uh, the, the core values we have, you know, share at Cogsy is once we do that and the kind of, you know, we as peers, but also this kind of the system of the process itself empowers every individual to kind of br just bring the magic. I think that's how we succeed ultimately. Like, it, I don't think it's a top-down thing, right? Like, Stefano and I are the custodians of that culture. It's ultimately the kind of the, the amazing team that we have that need to figure out most of the challenges that we need to solve. And I think they need to bring those, that unique, you, you know, whole self to work to be able to do that. For sure. No, I, I love it. And uh, it's a good segue to like my, my next question. I saw that you wrote a book around life profitability. I'd love if, yeah, you could like share more about what was the inspiration and what were you thinking when you wrote the book? Yeah. So I think like firstly, the kind of beyond the actual topic for the book, I think the biggest, um, my biggest motivation for writing the book was um, at that stage. So I wrote the book three, four years ago um, now. So my boys at that stage were probably about seven and four respectively. Um, so they're now 11, eight, and we've got a you know, seven month old uh, you know, daughter, baby daughter um, at home as well. And at that stage, I, I, I really just lost myself. I got really into um, stoicism um, and this kind of idea of contemplating your own mortality. And I, I asked myself, like, if something were to happen to me at this stage and um, my boys could not get to know me better, like, what could I leave them that was somewhat kind of representative or unique about their dad, right? And I think like much of kind of that um, intent went into kind of you know, writing a book at least. The reason why I wrote the book called Life Profitability, the, the precursor, um, and I mentioned it just now, was me and my team at um, you know Convergio stumbling onto that kind of wording or that language around how do we build a, a life and family first um, company? So th that's what I thought the book was gonna be initially. But then when I started working with editors, we evolved the concept to think kind of slightly broader and think about life profitability. And the kind of the essence of life profitability is just that whether it's your kind of whether it's you building your own business or just a professional endeavor, that doesn't matter. But how can you pursue that thing in a way that's ultimately accretive and and um, beneficial to your whole life? So I immediately don't believe in this notion that you have life and work. I think work, for example, is just part of life, right? I don't think that these are two opposite you know, ends of a scale and like one has to tip and kind of the other has to kind of, you know, has to rise. So like I I deconstruct that and instead, like I, I like this idea, Henry Sorrell, he said it in his book, Walden, which where he essentially proposes and he says, um, the thing, the, the cost of anything that we do in life is just life itself. Right. So the idea there is like, whether it's work, whether it's a hobby, whether it's like something like the thing that we're kind of, you're paying for that, the currency we're paying for that is life. So in your work, in your professional endeavors, like how can you at least do that? Like you will never be able to do it without sacrifice, without compromise, but how can you at least do that with this view of kind of broader life profitability? If, if you could quantify what broader life profitability could look like, I would advocate that you kind of orientate your kind of individual actions to supporting that versus just trying to like 
makes than these individual parts of your life. For sure. One, love that story around like uh, the inspiration for writing the book for, for, for your kids. And then two, like, yeah, I think this idea of like, yeah, how do you bring like your whole self and then uh, how like work is like part of uh, this, like, uh, yeah, you, you, your life and uh, and like having like keep keeping that perspective in mind and and so I'm curious uh, given like obviously I think w- with the macro environment like a, a lot of like startups founders are all kind of like uh, trying to figure out like h- how do they get through these like next next few months and all, all the challenges that they're facing and ask like a third time founder what are your thoughts on the current like environment we're in and then we'll love to hear some examples of just like challenges that you guys face at like WooCommerce and even like uh, Conversio and like what were some of the the, the hardest moments, but then like, um, and, and then how, how did you guys like approach that just in like in, in context of, yes, as like inspiration to, to founders uh, out there? Um, I think the kind of idea that I would base any, anything that sounds like advice you're off of, David, um, is yeah. ultimately this notion that you know, anything that goes out of equilibrium um, you know, over a period of time, eventually needs to move back to equilibrium. I think we see it like often kind of, you know, various parts of nature, it's a um, kind of, a, it's a natural phenomenon. And I think the same is true for, for business, which is why we see, often see kind of your know, business or the economy being kind of very cyclical in nature. And I actually think that um, like the context here, again, like I, I built the product that became Wu end of 2007, right? And that's, was the previous economic crash, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, the whole, like, I think many founders at that stage probably looked at the situation and said, hell, like, <laughs> like everything is is upside down. I don't know what the future looks like. How do I, you know, how do I be ambitious? How do I take risks in this environment? And I think, like, there's so many, I mean, WooCommerce is probably on the smaller end. There's many great companies that came, like, that were founded in those, kind of, those early years, right? So, like, I don't actually think that any given snapshot in time is indicative of being a stronger or kind of a a weaker cohort of companies that can be founded. So if you're starting a company today, like I would like orientate you to the same things as that that you should have done kind of your last year in a frothing market, which is like figure out how to create value um, and monetize that, right? If you can figure out how to create create value for a right set of people and you solve a real problem for them, like just do that. I think the only kind of nuance, like if if we expanded the the conversation to think through how do you fund this, right? Um, I do think kind of your much of venture capital seems to be a little bit of a wait and see game, right? Like many investors they have optionality back. Like it, the the pendulum has swung back from founders being um being able to, I'm going to say dictate terms, but being able to have a lot of leverage in conversations with investors. I think investors have more optionality now, and many of them are taking wait and see approach there, which effectively means that like if if that's you and you need to raise, like I would orientate myself to um as close as possible to profitability, if not profitability as soon as possible, which probably means things like and this is regurgitated advice, but like be frugal, be cost efficient. Um, and I think that's actually the thing there. Like I, um, the one thing that my team always laughed, like my conversion team at least always laughed at me about, and I probably have some scar tissue, which is why it's not showed up in Cogsy as much as, but I would often, because I had my kind of roots in bootstrapping, like the idea of kind of, you know, what is the cost benefit you know, here? What like uh, why should I spend one dollar? Like, uh, what am I hoping to get out on the other side? And just dialing that in, I think that's just a kind of a a mindset and a muscle. Like, it doesn't always work that way. Like, it, like the math proposing the math is simpler than execution there. But at least thinking through that lens and not assuming that you have an infinite runway, like that's that's the mental kind of your uh, kind of juggling um, that I that I'd be doing if I were a founder at this stage. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely like the the shift in mindset from 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 last year's like growth at all costs to to this year's. Yeah, like really thinking about like the ROI and like being intentional about spend. My final question is: uh, earlier you mentioned the reason you've stayed in like e-commerce in the last decade has been like uh, all the different people that you know and like the merchants that you got to work with and 
I'd love to just like hear a little bit more about, yeah, who, who are some of these like people or like merch, merchants that like uh, you've gotten a chance to like, interact with in the last decade that have like really like stuck out to you or like m- made a difference in, in your journey so far as both like uh, like a founder and entrepreneur, but also just even like somebody in like the, like, the world of e-commerce. Yeah, so um, oh, there's probably, I, I'm going to forget so many and, and <laughs> if any of my friends listen to this, like we're still friends and I still appreciate all of you. I think... Um, Probably going back from today and then moving back into the past, like things that stand out, David, is, um, like I mentioned, Mark Riskowitz over at Caraway earlier, like he's been instrumental in what we've built with Cogsy. Like I, I'm definitely a smarter human being um, today as a result of, of, of Mark, for example, specifically in this in this problem space. Um, before that, um, like the name that comes to mind, I think about uh, Ritas. Ritas is the one of the co-founders over at Omnisend, um, they started, he started building Omnisend about the same time as we built Convergio, um, similar stage, similar size, both going after you know, Clavio. So we were competitors. Um, he's still running a thriving business today. Um, and we're still friends. Like we, we, even as competitors, we managed to build a friendship so much so that he is an investor in Cogsy, right? Which I think is, wow. is fascinating. Yeah. And then I think kind of you all, all the way back, um, like I think, um, you know, but Matt Mullenweg, um, you know, but one of the original co-founders um, and core contributors for for WordPress itself, and the the you know, CEO and founder of Automatic. Like I think there's so much in business, and my DNA as an entrepreneur that I attribute to um, what I learned from him. Where, like, in the simplest version where he's always had to kind of you know, balance the ideals and the philosophy around kind of what open source means and the kind of commercialization of capitalism and how he's blended those things. Um, initially, when we started out, and I say we, like Magnus, Mark and I, like we were highly resistant to kind of you know, buying into the full ethos of open source. And Matt was a great teacher. And so much so like, that's, even though I like I don't release open software, you know, open source software today, but the you know some of those fundamental kind of learnings around how are you like how can you be a good citizen within the ecosystem um how do you build a business in such an environment um like there are fundamental beliefs um in terms of me as an entrepreneur awesome well adi this this is so much fun i feel like we, we covered the the range of topics uh in, in the last hour and like flew by really quickly and i'm sure like our, our audience uh uh, we'll learn and like has learned a, a, a ton through through this conversation in the last hour and so thanks thanks for taking the time and uh appreciate you uh making it to to the rudder uh webinar you're most welcome thanks again for having me thanks everyone for for tuning in as well awesome all right cheers Adi. we'll see you later